Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, coming to you from Washington's nicest indoor shooting facility. Of course, that is Security Gun Club located right here in Woodenville, Washington. You know, there's an old adage that says, uh, better be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. Now, many of us have had to learn that lesson the hard way, but apparently it's a lesson that the United States government has yet to learn but has given themselves not one, but two fantastic opportunities to learn that lesson the hard way. It also provides us in the lawful and responsible gun owning community two amazing opportunities to actually advance what should be inalienable rights. But has the United States government maybe bitten off a little bit more than they could chew here? Well, let's talk about it. So we're gonna talk about both of these cases and let's spend a few minutes and get yourself educated and let's talk about how DOJ is about to open Pandora's box on gun control. Okay, so we're talking about two separate cases today. We have both talked about them individually. We're gonna talk about them collectively now. The first is a case out of the Third Circuit. It is a case of Range versus Attorney General of the United States. The United States government is asking to review the Third Circuit's ruling, which found portions of 18 U.S.C. 922 unconstitutional. The other case is a case that comes out of the Fifth Circuit, and that is the case of Daniels versus the United States, in which the Fifth Circuit found other portions of 18 United States Code 922 unconstitutional. Now, as we know, next month we have a huge, huge uh, hearing before the United States Supreme Court in the matter of United States v. Rahimi. Now, this is going to determine whether or not it is appropriate to strip people of their otherwise inalienable rights based upon pre-trial indictment allegations found on probable cause of violent offenses. We will talk about that in a minute. What the Range case and the Daniels case, however, gives us an opportunity to answer what I believe is a much more pressing and important question, which is, do we have any historical precedent for stripping the firearm rights from non-violent, non-dangerous felons, or do we even have the right to strip firearm rights from those who use certain controlled substances? Because those are the two issues that will be decided if either of these cases are accepted for review by the United States Supreme Court. Now, just so you understand the facts here, in range, versus Attorney General of the United States. It's a case out of Pennsylvania. Mr. Range, who was a single father raising three kids, um, underreported his personal income so he could remain um, eligible for food stamps. When the state of Pennsylvania connected the dots, they charged him with a felony. Mr. Range could have been sentenced to a time exceeding one year. However, he ultimately ended up serving no jail time. Several years later, when Mr. Range went to purchase a firearm, he was denied the ability to purchase it because he had been convicted of a felony. And when he attempted to restore those rights, he was told that he would never, ever, ever be able to restore his Second Amendment rights due to that conviction. That prohibition occurred under 18 U.S.C. section 922 G1. Mr. Range then challenged the constitutionality of that particular section and the third circuit ruled that in fact there was no historical analog to justify the stripping of uh, second amendment rights from non-violent offenders and therefore that portion of 18 united states code 922 has been found unconstitutional the department of justice of course has completely crapped its pants and is now asking the supreme court to take review of that the other case is the case of Daniels versus the United States. This is a case that originates out of Mississippi. Mr. Daniels was pulled over for a routine traffic stop, a license plate violation. Uh, officers then later recovered from the car evidence that he smoked marijuana. They found a bunch of roaches, uh, used marijuana joints, as well as two firearms. During a post-custody interview, Mr. Daniels also admitted that he was a relatively frequent user of cannabis. He was then charged under 18 U.S.C. 922 section G3 with being an unlawful user of controlled substances while being in possession of a firearm, basically the Hunter Biden violation. Mr. Daniels challenged the constitutionality of that statute saying, hey, there is no historical precedent from barring firearms from people who use controlled substances. There may be a precedent for barring them while they're under the influence of such. And it's really important to note that even though in the Daniels case, police officers did find evidence that of marijuana consumption. They never once 
tested him under any type of DUI standard. So there was zero evidence to suggest that Mr. Daniels was under the influence of marijuana at that particular time. There is a tradition, a historical tradition of restricting firearms from those that are actually under the influence at that moment. But do we have any historical tradition of restricting firearms merely because a person occasionally uses a substance at some time? The Fifth Circuit has found, no, it does not. There is no historical analog, and therefore 18 U.S.C. 922 G3 is also unconstitutional. The United States has asked for a writ of certiorari on that matter as well. So they are asking the United States Supreme Court to accept review of both of these cases. And I think that all of us in the lawful and responsible gun owning community should say to the Supreme Court, do it, please do it. And while you're at it, do a few other things like uh, assault weapon bans, magazine bans, things as such as that. But these are two cases that I believe if the United States Supreme Court accepts review, these are two amazing opportunities to definitively advance what should have been otherwise inalienable rights. So let me explain why. When we talk about historical traditions, as will be discussed in the United States v. Rahimi case coming up next month, there is undoubtedly a rich historical tradition of permitting restrictions and stripping firearm rights from individuals that society deems as dangerous. Now, if we go back and we look at the old historical analogs, all of those were based on completely ridiculous grounds, oftentimes dealing with the color of a person's skin or their religious beliefs. But in, as we take a look at what was historically accepted by American society, those that were deemed dangerous typically society did permit their firearm rights to be taken from them. Such is the case with Mr. Rahimi when you take a look at what Mr. Rahimi has been accused of. So it has always been Washington gun law's opinion that the United States is likely to prevail at this argument, even with this current makeup of this Supreme Court. However, when we get outside of dangerous individuals, and we just talk about people who have felony convictions, and there is a multitude of felonies in every state that does not involve violence, does not involve sex offense, many of them are property crimes, and the individual actually does not necessarily pose a danger to society, even during the commission of that particular crime. There is no historical tradition of restricting firearm or access to firearms for individuals such as that. In addition, there is no historical tradition of restricting Second Amendment rights from people who choose to use controlled substances on certain occasions, okay? Yes, there is a long history of primarily with intoxicants, with alcohol, restricting the ability to possess firearms while you are actually under the influence of alcohol. And Daniels is not suggesting that people who are actually stoned at that time have the right to possess a firearm. But do, does a cannabis user, whether they're using it medically or recreationally, does that bar them throughout the rest of their life now from possessing a firearm? These are two issues that need to be addressed by the United States Supreme Court. We talked about it in this video right here, that these were two issues that absolutely positively had to be accepted. And the United States government, the Department of Justice, is literally going to gift wrap that and hand it to us. So the two cases that we need to very carefully watch, one is Range versus Attorney General of the United States. It comes from the Third Circuit. The second case is Daniels versus the United States. It comes from the Fifth Circuit. We'll link both of them up down below so you can geek out on them for yourself. If you got any other questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington Gun Law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is also down there in the description box. Now, in the meantime, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.